now. We're eight days away from elections, and he was summoned to the eight o'clock news. So elections, we had to go there. So you have, you're getting second best. Um, he speaks English much better than me, the mayor. Uh, I apologize uh, in advance. Um, yeah, actually, there the are few things that I wanted to master in my life. One of them is my English, and the other one is my wife, and I failed in both of them. <laughs> anyway, good evening. I'm very glad that you invite us to greet us in the special event. There's a great mix here of veteran Israelis and immigrants, guests from North America who are in town for the GA. The first mayor of Tel Aviv, Mayor Dizengov, said, Tel Aviv's destiny is to develop and attract all creative forces within, in our nation and to serve as the center of the Jewish world, a lighthouse for the home of every idea. Actually, if you look at the symbol, the crest of Tel Aviv, you will see there is a lighthouse there. The lighthouse was printed in our crest of Tel Aviv before we even had a lighthouse in Tel Aviv. But we saw the future. <laughs> the pilgrims saw the future. We have become indeed a center of culture, education, technology, and finance, and also a center of the Jewish world. There are hundreds of synagogues in the city belonging to everyone. Because in Tel Aviv, Yafo, we believe that everyone has free, is free to participate and practice any religion they want. In addition, we provide budgets of hundreds, and budgets and hundreds of projects for Jewish renewal and Jewish culture. The most important, we believe that the Jewish values and in the universal values of morality that we receive from the prophets are in this city. Pluralism, tolerance, and acceptance of the other. This is the principle of Tel Aviv Yafo. We invest major efforts to protect our values from people who want to divide us. We will continue to safeguard these ideas and from every threat. In the recent years, our city has attracted tens of thousands of new Jewish immigrants who fell in love with our beautiful city, the unique model of Jewish life. In the last four years, Tel Aviv Yafo has absorbed more immigrants than any other city in Israel. For the first time since 1948, Jews around the world want to fulfill their Zionist dream in our city. In, in return, we triple our budget for absorbing new immigrants and the number of people working to fulfill this field. In our next term, next term, elections, <laughs> we intend to open a new immigrants hub that will house all the relevant municipality service under one roof. We are grateful for all of you who have chosen to live here, and all of you who have chosen to visit our city. For all of you, Tel Aviv Yafo will always be your home. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Um, friends, we're going to be brief because I know we have come here to learn and not listen to speeches, but I want to say a few thank yous, if I may, uh, because you can see behind us the, the Limud, the Limud slogan, taking you one step further. And we wouldn't be able to take any steps further this evening if it wasn't for uh, a number of volunteers. Limud is put together by volunteers and the Limud volunteer team tonight was led by Jay Schultz. If you're here, Jay, thank you. And all of the volunteers from Tel Aviv. Nadia Levine, who helped put this wonderful program together with many volunteers from Jerusalem and my dear friends from Limud FSU who work across Israel and across the Jewish world. Thank you, Roman, Chaim, and Sandy, and Natasha, and Tanya, and anyone else we forgot. Thank you to all of our volunteers. Uh, this is what Limud is about. Tonight is a call to all of you who haven't been to a Limud, who are interested in what it stands for. It is inclusive, it is intergenerational, it is open for everyone to learn together, but it is really powered by the community. And here in Tel Aviv, we have a wonderful Limud, and in nine other places across Israel, from the Arava down south to the Galil, up north there are Limud communities, 
And tonight we're celebrating the launch of Limud Israel, which is an Amuta, a, a 501c3, to support all of the Limuds across the country. So you too can volunteer, and we would welcome that. My uh, Amuta member Gerson is at the front door tonight, so if anyone would like to know how to do that. Uh, we'd also like to thank our partners. So apart from the municipality and the Broad Center, we have many partners who've helped make tonight possible. And those are Limud FSU, Limud Jerusalem, the Am Yisrael Foundation, Times of Israel, Aleph Hillel Israel, Our Crowd, Golan Heights Winery, and many more. Thank you to all of our partners, and thank you to all of our presenters. One thing you may not know is that who's presenting this evening is also a volunteer. They're giving up of their time and their wisdom, and we're very grateful for that. Thank you. So, we're going to go straight into the first session. So, if you don't know what the options are, I'll quickly read through them. And then for the second and third sessions, they're on the door, just outside of every room. So, we have in this room, we have Torah and technology towards wealth and well-being, and that is with John Medved and Michael Eisenberg, moderated by Alison Kaplan Summer. That is in here. This is Rothschild. Next door, in Diesengoff, we have Jerusalem, a life story, with Sarah Tuttle Singer, in conversation with Matthew Kalman. Upstairs, in Jabotinsky, that's the second floor on the right-hand side, uh, remaining one people, the future of the Israeli-American Jewish dialogue, and that's with Alon Friedman. Also upstairs in Ibn Virol, we have Bring On the Jewish Learning Revolution with Hannah Kanzen. And lastly, in Ben Yehuda, which is also upstairs, we have a Chavruta session, which is an interactive learning session on Jewish life's special character in the land of Israel. And that is with Jonathan Feldman. We wish you a fruitful evening, and we hope to see you at another Limud soon, and thank you. important uh, investors in the high-tech scene moving chairs, so it's the spirit of the movie. Atmosphere, I noticed that the Jews weren't as quite into poverty ideologically as, uh, as some of my, uh, my Christian neighbors. Their theology pretty consistently sees wealth as an obstacle to faith, although recently there's been a trend among evangelicals, right, called prosperity gospel. Um, so I decided to look, uh, I'm no Torah scholar, but I decided to kind of look up for myself uh, what the attitudes were towards uh, Torah, technology, wealth, etc. Um, I found on the Chabad website a discussion of the Jacob and Esau parsha, where Jacob runs away from uh, from Esau and runs away from home in order to escape his brother's wrath. He goes abroad. He lives with his uncle. He makes a lot of money. Um, uh, Esau feels like he's wrongly deprived of his birthright and his father's blessings. He wants to kill Jacob. He plans war against him. So Jacob, who's meanwhile made quite a bit of money, um, sends a gift of livestock to Esau. And it says that he lived temporarily with his uncle, and he was giving back this gift uh, to Esau, the, uh, who felt deprived. So the interpretation stresses the use of the word temporary as showing this was a means to an end, and that wealth itself is temporary, uh, so that in Jewish teaching, wealth is not the purpose. It's the means to create a great atmosphere, a Jewish home, children, guests at the table, to be able to give time, attention, love, Jewish education and charity, and share with others in the community and, uh, and play a part in, uh, in everyone's well-being. Um, Nechama Leibowitz interpreted the Birkat Kohanim, the priestly blessing, and saying that its words underscore one of the fundamental premises of the Jewish tradition, 
the relationship between the material and spiritual well-being. Uh, she quotes Pirkei Avot, and Kemach, and Torah, and Torah, and Kemach, without sustenance there's no Torah, without Torah there's no sustenance. So that material wealth and spiritual enlightenment are both tools that we as Jews are commanded to use in a manner that brings us closer to God. So in establishing that wealth is indeed a blessing, I would like to introduce you to two very blessed individuals beside me. Um, Michael Eisenberg is a partner at Aleph, which is an early stage venture capital fund with um, 330,000, is that a stage number? 330 million uh, under management? Um, Aleph focuses on serving Israeli entrepreneurs who want to build uh, scalable global biz uh, businesses. Since it was founded in 2013, Aleph has invested in more than 20 companies, including some names we know, WeWork, Lemonade, Winward, HoneyBook, Nexar, Common Sense Robotics. Uh, before that, Michael was a general partner at Benchmark Capital, um, and he continues as a partner responsible for Benchmark's Israeli portfolio. He's focused on internet investments since 1995 and has invested in and sat on the board of some of Israel's leading companies and startups. Um, he's on this year's Forbes Midas list. The Midas list is a data-driven ranking of the world's 100 top venture capitalists based on all exits above $200 million. Um, I actually got to know Michael because I've been reading his blog since 2006. He's got a great blog called Six Kids and a Full-Time Job. He serves on nonprofit boards, um, including Yeshivat uh, Havatzion and the Shomer HaChadash. He was in Jerusalem uh, with his wife. And all the, it was six kids and now you have eight kids. So yeah, the title of the blog is out of date. Um, and next to him is uh, the legendary uh, Jonathan Medved, founder and CEO of Our Crowd, the leading global equity crowdfunding platform for accredited investors and angels. Um, Our Crowd, according to Forbes, is one of the largest crowdfunding organizations on the planet. Um, Our Crowd uh, has made many exits. Companies sold to Uber, Canon, Oracle, Intel. Uh, Bloomberg Business called Our Crowd hands down the most successful equity crowdfunding platform in the world right now. He's an investor, an entrepreneur. He's founded some very successful Israeli startups. And altogether, over the past two decades, he's invested in almost 250 startup companies. Um, he was the founder and general partner of Israel Seed Partners, uh, one of Israel's leading venture capital funds. At one point, these guys were part of the same team. Uh, Michael was also uh, a partner of the firm, so I guess this cast is like getting the band back together again. John was kind enough to hire me. <laughs> Um, the list of nonprofit boards that Michael serves on is endless, and we have limited time. Um, uh, John lives in Jerusalem with his wife Jane and his four children and seven grandchildren. You don't live with everybody, right? Eight grandchildren. Okay, I also have to update the list. Uh, he's known internationally for his signature Hawaiian shirts, but he decided to go business casual tonight. I <laughs> Um, and oh, a uh, disclaimer in that um, uh, our crowd and Jonathan are the lead investors. This is a small country in my brother's startup, so if I'm extra nice to him, it's because of that. <laughs> okay, so um, we're going to start off with, um, with the talk by uh, Michael, then we'll move to John. We'll have a little conversation, and in the leading new tradition, there will be time for discussion. Thank you. So, um, yeah, is that okay? So, Oops. That started a little late. Nadia has this on a clock, so you'll see I'm taking out my phone. It's on airplane mode, but I'm going to put a timer on it so that I don't run over my time. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. It's exciting to be here and exciting to share a stage with John, uh, who, like I said earlier, uh, hired me. And um, uh, what I want to talk about tonight, the title of the talk was From Noah to Abraham, From Noah to Abraham, uh, and the Jewish Approach to, to Innovation. But before that, I'd like to start by talking about a dead Anglican priest, a French president, and a prime minister of Israel, uh, who kind of walk into a room together, at least, at least this room, and start, and this wasn't how I intended to start, but the fodder was so good I couldn't resist. So uh, on Friday, French President Emmanuel Macron said, I always say, present me the woman who decided, being perfectly educated, to have seven, eight, or nine children. I introduced him to my wife, who is perfectly educated with the masters and had eight children. And he is but the most recent in a long line of people like this, and we'll talk about them through the Torah in a second. Uh, the dead Anglican priest is none other than Thomas Malthus, who in 1798 said, 
that the increase of population is necessarily limited by the means of subsistence. This would be uh, obvious to most people on some level. That population does invariably increase when the means of subsistence increases, that is, there's more food, there's more people, and that the superior population is repressed by moral restraint by some misery. Malthus was not a very optimistic guy and insisted that the planet would not be able to service all of humanity uh, that would be born from prosperity. And it is that that I wish to take issue with this evening, both with Macron and Malthus, the dead English or Anglican cleric and the current French president, by looking at our own sources, uh, the Torah. And uh, I start at the end of Parshat Noah, which we read about 10 days ago, uh, where the Torah tells us, Vayachel Noach isha adama vayitakarem, and Noach began, this is after the flood, and he planted a vineyard. And this is a verse that appears after uh, Noach leaves, leaves the ark, and it tells us that he is going to be a farmer. It tells us something else, which I will get back to in a second. And the rabbis point out on this verse, they refer back to a verse at the end of Parshat Bereshit, the first parsha in the Torah, the verse goes, And this, this, referring to a person most likely, will relieve the suffering of our wretched land. And Chazal, the rabbis, teach us from this verse that Noah invented the plow. Noah is the first inventor uh, that we read in the, about the agrarian economy. We had some musicians before that, just like tonight. But Noah invents the plow. And I want to ask, how did the rabbis come up with this insight that Noah invented the plow? And I will remind you again of Malthus's uh, statement that the power of population is indefinitely greater than the power in the earth to produce sustenance for man. That is, people prefer or enjoy having children more than the land can feed them. And therefore, necessarily, population growth must be curtailed. And so we had something similar happen, and I'm going to read you a list of numbers to give you the background to how the rabbis arrived at the fact that Noah invented the plow. Here's the list of numbers. Pay attention carefully. 130, 105, 90, 70, 65. That is a decreasing set of five numbers. 130, 105, 90, 70, 65. And then we have 162, then another 65, which I'll touch on for a second. 162, I'm skipping, 187, 182, 500. We have a descending series of five numbers beginning at 130 going down to 65. Boom, up to 162, and then to 500. The blip on the list is a man named Hanoch, who was the sixth generation born to Adam, the first person, who had children at a younger age. The list I've read you is the list in which the Torah tells us that each of the progenitors of humanity gave birth to children. Pay attention. Five years of descending numbers, and then five years of numbers going way up, up until Noah, who has his first children at the age of 500. And I want to ask, what happened? Interestingly, the tie turns with someone whose name is Yered. Yered means, roughly, we go down, or things are down, or things are depressed. I'm going to claim, and attempt to assert in a second, that what happened in Yeret's time was that population growth exceeded the world's ability to feed these people. And therefore, the growth of population decreased. People began having children at a later age. We can start to prove this. The Torah uses very exact language. It tells us, for example, by Yeret, Shtayim, Vishishim, Shana, Ma'at, Shana, Ve'olet, Chaloch. And Yerid lived 160 years. He had a child, and his name was Chanoch. The next one, Vayechim Metushelach, the famous Mesushelach, who lived a very, very, very long life. And he lived Sheva Ushmonim Shana, Ma'at Shana, Vayolid Lamech, he lived 187 years, and he had Lemech as a child. A man lives X number of years and has a child named so-and-so. Later on, we arrive after Lemech. And about Lemech, it tells us, And Lemech, his child, lived 182 years. Again, the numbers are going back up. And he had a child who is anonymous. It's the only time in a list of ten where it tells us, in a pronoun form, that a son was born. 
And then later, it tells us that they called his name Noah. Now, why did the Torah change the way these verses are laid out? What I want to suggest is that his name wasn't originally Noah. Everybody else, all nine other people born, it says so-and-so had a baby at this age and his name, called his name so-and-so, his name, Lemeth, Hanoch, etc. Noah is called the son, because I think his name wasn't Noah. He became known as Noah when, as Chazal said, he invented the plow. He invents the plow, he changes the arc of sustenance on the planet. Remember what happened. The Asian people had babies comes down, all of a sudden it turns around. There was population, too much population, all of a sudden it turned around, and people started having babies at a later age because they could not feed them. Then Noah comes, he invents the plow, and food production goes up. And we can prove this, because the Torah tells us, Noach ben Noach Noach lives 500 years, and then he has his first three children, or maybe his only three children. He has three children at the age of 500. And right after that, the Torah tells us, And it happened that human beings began to repopulate and increase the population of the world. Right after Noah decided to jump in and have children, because you could feed this population, people started to have children. And what happened was, Noah came, and I assume the rabbis assume he invented the plow to increase the sustenance. And it unlocked both the land, which had been wretched and cursed. It made it easier to grow food. And it unlocked the wombs of the women. Itzivon yadenu, that word, etzev, and be'etzev kelbi banim, from the Kalah and Sefer Reshit, are the same word. It was stopped because it was painful, because it was difficult to feed these children. And all of a the sudden, there's a huge population increase. And after each population increase, the Torah tells us very simply that we had Hamas, not the ones in Gaza, but Hamas, meaning an erosion in society. Population begins to grow, and we understand that from this innovation of the plow, wealth also begins to grow. Where else did Noah get the money, of course, to build the ark? And population grows, wealth grows, people grow, and that causes Hamas. What is Hamas? So when I grew up in, in kindergarten, they told me the Hamas was kind of violent. You beat up people and took their money. It was like money in the streets of New York. I don't think that's what the word means. I think what Hamas means is a slow but sure erosion in trust. We have a verse in Megillat Echa, Vayachmos Kagan Sukkot Shechet Mo'ado, that this covering, this sukkah, slowly erodes as it dries up and peels back and no longer provides shade. The Jerusalem Talmud tells us that what people did is they take a cup of turmusin, turmusin are these little lentils, lentil-like things, and they took just a couple of extra turmusin from their friends and lied about the weights and measures of two turmusin. This creates a slow erosion of trust. Again, population grows, wealth grows, and society begins to break down. The greed in society, the lack of trust, begins to undermine the fundamentals of society. We have a wealthy society with no values. Think about it again. No one invents the plow. Society begins to reproduce, grow, creates a lot of wealth, and we have a breakdown in the morals of society. And we begin to understand then what happens to Noah after the flood. Noah having experienced that the fruits of his innovation, the fruits of his labor, has led to great wealth, Great growth in population and utterly the destruction of society because it was destroyed from Bifnim. It becomes destroyed from within. God didn't destroy it, it was destroyed. And therefore he comes to a different conclusion when he leaves the ark. Noah leaves the ark. He plants a vineyard. Mayach Noach Isha Dama and Noach begins, he is a man of the land and he plants a vineyard. And what does he do when he plants the vineyard? He creates wine. What innovation is this? It's the first mention of wine in the Torah. Chemistry. Noah understands fermentation, he understands how you take a regular grape and you turn it into wine. So we have Noah inventing mechanics of plowing, and now wine. And now what does he do? He drinks from the wine, he becomes drunk, 
and naked in his tent. Think about what happened to Noah. My first invention, says Noah, was the plow. I created great sustenance for humanity. We had great growth and great wealth, and I got wealthy and built an ark, and humanity destroyed itself from this innovation. My next innovation, chemistry. My next innovation, winemaking. I'm not sharing with humanity. I'm taking it into my tent and drinking myself into a slumber and a stupor. Why did he do this? It's because he was afraid of the power of his invention. He was afraid that just like his last invention and innovation, it would be abused. It would be abused. He had melancholy more than anything else. He was distraught by what his innovation had wrought with society. This, I'm going to argue, was the wrong lesson. Noah took the wrong lesson away. The answer wasn't that innovation should cause destruction. The answer was that innovation without ethics, without morals, without societal values, will cause wealth gaps and a loss of trust. But Noah retreated into himself. And we can tell this from another thing the rabbis tell us, but I think it's very obvious from the verses. Which the rabbis ask, beginning of Parshat Noach, Ela toldot Noach, Noach ish tzadik, tamim aya bedorotav, eta elohim italech Noach. These are the progeny of Noah. Noah was a righteous man in his generation. And the rabbis ask, was he a righteous man in his generation? Or was he a righteous man for all times? Meaning, had he lived in the generation of Abraham, would he also be considered a righteous man? Or no, he was only righteous because everybody else was so lousy and had moral turpitude. And I think the answer stands very clearly. When Abraham Avinu, the father of the Jewish people, comes along, the Torah tells us something very, very simple. He never calls Abraham a tzaddik. He's never called a righteous man. Because the righteous man retreats into himself. He innovates for himself. He's okay by himself. The father of a nation who wants to build a country in an ethos must go out and spread a message of righteousness. And that is very different from being a righteous person. It's very different from being somebody who innovates the sake of innovation. Avram too is an extraordinarily wealthy man. The Torah tells us, Avraham kaved me'od ba'mitneh ba'kesef u'bazahav. Avraham had tons of wealth, uh, uh, herds of sheep and gold and silver, and he went all over the place. And then, not in his own backyard, but in the five towns along what's now the Dead Sea, he saw tremendous moral destruction in stone ba'amorah. And Abraham walks over to God and says, God, uh-uh, do not destroy these people. They may be destroying themselves because of their extreme wealth. The Torah tells us in Sodom and Gomorrah and Sodom and Amorah, Ki Hashem Ke'eretz Mitzrayim. It is an incredibly fertile and wealthy land. In fact, that's why the First World War was waged there. They came after the gold and silver and the wonderful wealth of Sodom and Amorah. But Abraham says, take care of these people. We can save them. Will the judge of the whole world not do justice by these bad people? He stood up for the bad people. He stood up to God and said, God, stop. Enough, we're not going to do this. And when God tells us why Abraham was chosen, this very, very wealthy man, he says, here's why Abraham was chosen to build a nation and to build this land. Ki da'ativ l'mana sheyitzavet banav ve'et v'to acharav because I know about Abraham. I know about him, that he will tell his children and the people that will fill this land that they will do justice and righteousness. That's the way of God. And they will do it for other people. And they will stand up to the injustices of society to do that. Abraham took his wealth and said, I'm going to spread a message of moral values. And therefore, he's the father of this nation. And therefore, he's the father of the ethos of this country needs to be. Noah took his innovation, created incredible wealth, but forgot to teach the moral lessons along with it. And I started with the Anglican priest, the dead Anglican priest, the French president. They got it wrong. You can have children. You can have wealth. You should have more children. You must teach ethical and moral values. And the third person in that is our prime minister, Netanyahu. Well, excuse me, but this week talked about the wonderful decade of wealth creation in this country. It is not enough to talk about wealth creation. 
that is necessary but insufficient. It is the job of leadership of this country in the footsteps of Abraham Avinu to ask what is the justice, what are the values, what are the ethics that we will teach ourselves and everybody else along with that wealth. Thank you.